valley and mountain, river and plain, through wind and storm, rides Anne of the Airlines. Having dropped out of sight completely after delivering an important message, Anne Burton is thought to be trying to make her way out of the Everglades of Florida. Art Morrison, radio inspector, and Aunt Hattie Jackson await her arrival at an emergency landing field near Miami, when they are joined rather unceremoniously by an old fellow who gives the name of Zebulon Abercrombie. Zeb, as he prefers to be called, was the original discoverer of the diamond mines from which the illicit diamond smugglers are obtaining their rough stones, and he was forced to leave Africa by the leader of the smugglers known as Doc who now menaces the future of Anne and pilot Jack Baker. Zeb agrees to join the government secret service in ferreting out the members of the gang and to show Morrison the exact location of the mines. They are interrupted in their plans by the reception of a radio call from secret service headquarters telling that the voice of Anne has been heard over the transmitter of the plane that is to be used by the smugglers in their projected flight to Africa. From the same source it has learned that Jack Baker who is piloting the ship while he pretends to join the smugglers is about ready to take off. But has Anne been able to leave the seclusion of the transport cabin? Or will she be found there by the two gangsters, Vic and Joe, before Jack learns she has not escaped? Let's go to the secret landing field in the heart of the Everglades and learn what we can. Gee whiz, 3,100 gallons of gas and all that oil. I don't see how them trucks made it through that road. Those drivers are just better at it than you are, Joey, which is no compliment to them either. You think that's enough gas, Baker? Talking to me, Morgan. Touch your motor so you can hear me, will you? Well, that's better. I said, do you think that's enough gas for the trip? Well, if it isn't, I don't know just where you'd put any more. We've got every drop these tanks will hold. And getting this ship off a field of this size is not going to be a snap, I can tell you. With all that gas, well, we'd better make it the first time, that's all. Gee, I wish there was a fire department to sort of stand by. I'd feel a lot safer. Are you getting cold feet, Joey? You haven't answered my question yet, Baker. Do you think that's enough gas to take us across? Well, at 300 miles an hour and flying at 20,000 feet, or maybe just a little higher, we'll burn the same fuel that we would at 10,000 doing 200. That is, in the same time. In other words, we'll save about one-third by taking the higher altitude. 20,000 feet? Boy, we won't be able to breathe at all unless we got those oxygen things they wear. Oh, sure we will. This job has a sealed cabin, and the air we get is supercharged. Like the air that goes into the carburetor when we reach the higher altitudes. You get it? No, but go on. I'll probably get it after a while. Joey, don't catch on fast, that's all. How much gas will it take to get us to Africa? I'll put it that way. That's what I was trying to get at, Morgan. At 200 miles an hour, these motors have been tested to use up about uh, 200 gallons an hour. Which roughly puts us somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. If we try it nonstop, is that it? Joey isn't the only one that doesn't quite understand the theory of substratosphere flying, it seems. That 200 gallons at 200 an hour was at 10,000 feet. Now, by flying higher, we remove part of the resistance because the air pressure on the ship is about one half what it is at the lower levels. And so, allowing for a bit of efficiency that is lost by the lower pressure, we find our gas mileage stepped up about one third, which means that our 3,100 gallons should take us something better than 4,200 miles. You see, Joey, that 4,200 miles gives us plenty of leeway. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Unless maybe we should happen to hit a wind which ain't blowing our direction. That's right, Joe. Any headwind we hit will just knock that many miles off our gas mileage, and a tailwind will add to it. Yeah. I remember reading in the papers a few years ago about a French fellow that tried to fly to America, 
and he had to fight the wind all the way. And so, when he got just a little over halfway across the ocean, he found that he didn't have gas enough to make it. So he just turned around and went back. He flew over halfway across and didn't have enough gas to make it, so he flew back. Joey, listen. I think the Everglades have been too much for you. Now quit trying to tell us fairy stories and start getting that stuff in the shack down here to the ship. Now see that you don't let it fall in the water, get it? Okay, Vic. I ain't telling stories. You can ask Jack. Now the idea of telling stuff like that. You see? That's what I was telling you, Baker. Joe is all right sometimes, only he's, well, sort of weak above the eyes, that's all. Joe's absolutely right about that story. It actually happened. You see, the tailwind added enough mileage. For instance, if it was a 40-mile-an-hour wind, it added 40 miles every hour to his mileage, while it was taking that away from the mileage on his way out. Or a difference of 80 miles every hour and the miles covered on the same amount of gas. How do you see? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I do. Now, what do you think of our chances with this ship? I think we'll make it. If that stuff that came in on that truck isn't too heavy... Just what was that, anyway? Supplies, Baker. Supplies. I get it. Okay. Well, this transport is built to carry about 40 passengers in ordinary service. But the weight of the extra gas naturally cuts that down quite a bit. So the weight of those, well, supplies, as you call them, means quite a bit. Especially on the takeoff. Well, I can tell you this much. Those two fellows on the truck had quite a time loading this stuff into the baggage compartment. In other words, it's heavy. And that means that we won't be able to get as much altitude and save as much gas as we would if we were flying light. Well, maybe I can relieve your mind a little with this bit of news. The reason we picked on this new transport ship, which is a little bigger than anything else, is because we're kind of pioneering a new airline, see? In other words, we're fixing it so this flying diamonds back here and sending supplies back over to Africa is going to be put on a regular schedule, just like the transatlantic and the trans-Pacific passenger planes. Only we don't have the custom officials nosing into our business. Oh, very interesting, Morgan. Except that you don't pick up planes every day that will fly the Atlantic non-stop with a load. And keeping preparations for such a flight undercover for any length of time will be quite a job in itself. And once the suspicion leaks out, it won't be long until the government starts to work. And then... Baker, you just tend to flying this ship for us. And we'll take care of the government. Now, here's how we keep this whole thing in the dark. We don't try any non-stop flights, see? That is just at present. We're going to establish bases and make flights in short hops. And from secluded points that won't create any publicity, you see? Very clever. But a plane leaving the United States and later showing up in, say, Cape Town, South Africa. Well, no one will be foolish enough to believe that someone trundled that plane across the Atlantic in a rowboat. No, that will paint a little change of license numbers now and then won't leave any holes like that. So here's where we come in with this ship. We're stopping at several places and leaving some of these supplies so that the people that are already there can start to work. You don't mind telling me the first stop then, do you? Of course not. The first place we head for will be a little place just south of the, uh, that cape that sticks out there in South America. Oh, you mean Cape St. Roque? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's where we stop first. Say, what's that noise I've been hearing all this time? That kind of buzzing. Oh, that's the radio transmitter. I just wanted to see how it was acting since we sent that message to Springfield a while ago. We never got an answer from them, by the way. Of course we didn't. You don't suppose that the doc is foolish enough to do any sending, do you? So they can find out where we are? Oh, that's right. Uh, I never thought of that. Well, it just shows you the doc is a pretty wise guy. And that's just a warning to anybody that might get ideas about sending messages from airplanes. The doc has a few stations himself, and his operators know how to locate transmitters, too. I get it, Morgan. You don't have to worry about that. I wasn't worrying. I was just reminding, that's all. Say, we better go up and give Joe a lift with that stuff. We should have had the guy with the truck do that. If you don't mind, Morgan, I'll, I'll stay here and check these motors over a bit so that, uh... Nope, I'm afraid I mind, Baker. I already told you where we're heading. And I'm not going to let you get out of my sight until we land in Africa. Okay. We might as well leave this cabin door open if we're coming back. My, I thought they'd never leave. Gosh, but it's stuffy in that baggage compartment. Now, if they'll just stay away long enough for me to get behind that shed. The radio is on. If I only knew how to work it, I might send some kind of a message. I could write Jack a note, but where could I leave it? The radio headphones. No one will use them but him. I can fold up a note and put it in one of the earphones. What did I do with my pencil? Oh, here it is. And that scrap of paper will have to do. Let's see. Jack, just left before you. Is that someone coming? Oh, it is, and I haven't a chance to get outside. I'll have to get back into that compartment and wait until they leave again. Da, 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 da. Gee, I get all the heavy work to do. But I guess maybe it's... I don't know. What's this? Say, I wonder if... I guess we can put that stuff in the baggage compartment, huh, Baker? Okay. Well, that'll just about get it. Hey, Joe, what are you doing up here in the cabin? I was just stowing this grub away where we could get it right handy. You never know when you're going to get hungry. How are those motors heading, Baker? Oh, the motors are okay. 
I think that all we need now are some instructions from Doc. I told you that Doc will not be using his radio station for a day or so, didn't I? Not while the government is trying to check him. And after that, they'll have to locate his new wavelength and start all over again. No, we got all the instructions we need, Baker. Say, listen, do you fellas hear anything? Uh, not a thing, except... Say, that sounds like a plane to me. Probably just some of the boys from Pensacola on their way home. Hey, there it is, right over there. And it's an air cat. Looks like something dropping from it. Gee, it's a guy with a parachute. See, it opened up. Baker, I don't know, but that air cat and that guy are jumping look, looking pretty fishy. Hey, what is that? Maybe you didn't have anything to do with it. But we're not taking any chances. We're taking off right now. Morgan, you know as well as I do, I haven't had any opportunity to communicate with anybody, even if I'd wanted to. All right, all right. But we're not taking any chances. Come on, get those motors warmed up. I'll run up to the shack and lock up. And Joe, take care of Baker while I'm gone. Okay. I guess I better get these shocks out from under the wheel. All right, Joe. I'll climb in and head her around. The wind is okay for a takeoff from this end, so we'll just let her sit. Okay, Baker. Okay. <laughs> I wonder just what that air cat was doing over here. And who was in that parachute? I wonder if it was Anne again. She wouldn't be making another trip back here. Well, I guess that's all. Say, Jack, here's a little thing I found on the floor of the cabin a few minutes ago when I come back. An automatic pencil. And it's engraved Anne. You say you found it just a few minutes ago here? Yeah. And it wasn't there an hour ago because I looked all over the floor then for a quarter I dropped. I don't understand how it could be in here. I don't either, especially when I know that nobody has left this cabin. But you'd better put that pencil away because here comes Vic. And maybe you wouldn't want him to know about it, maybe. Joe, I don't know how to thank you. Or oh, skip it. Oh, here he is. All set, Vic? Yeah, all set. You ready, Baker? All set. Then here's your chart on that course. Now let's get out of here quick. All right, we're on our way to Cape St. Roque. Jack Baker and the two gangsters off on the first leg of the trip that is to take them to South Africa. Can it be that Joe suspects that Ann Burton is concealed in the baggage compartment? And why did he not tell Vic instead of confiding to Jack? Will Morrison and Aunt Hattie locate the secret field now empty and land? Or will they proceed to Springfield in an effort to learn the secret of the Tyler Sanitarium? We're just as anxious as we know you are to learn the answers in the next thrilling episode of Anne of the Airlines. <laughs>